Common Knowledge is brought to you by our friends at Game Grid Midvale, our local game store who puts players first with weekly competitive events, below market pricing, and the best customer service available. Check out their online inventory using the link in our description. We are also sponsored by InkGaming.com. Use coupon code CCMTG10 at checkout for a 10% discount on all Inked Gaming supplies and accessories. You can support the show directly through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash common knowledge. This is the Common Knowledge Podcast. It's not about the cost. It's about the knowledge. Here are your hosts, Brandon Clark and Lauber. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to episode 94 of... What is it? What is it, Sean? What is it? the common knowledge podcast yeah we're the podcast <laughs> we're gonna talk about cube today it'll be fun but first a little housekeeping we gotta get down to business here how are you doing sean <laughs> i was real confused I was like, what? Was so business? confused. He's like what the heck what is he talking about i'm doing real good just got off of a date with my wonderful girlfriend and we went for like a, a painting thing and then we went to a fancy restaurant it was fantastic so i'm all full of lobster and scallops. whatever scallops i can never i get scallops and shallots mixed up because they're so similar one comes from the sea and is a shellfish and then one is a you know a little sweet onion little planty boy they're almost exactly the same. <laughs> the words are the same. Cut me up. Cut me some slack. Anyway, I'm full of that. I'm feeling good. Uh, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited. I got a sweet promotion at work, so I'm a chef now. I'm a real chef. I'm not a line cook anymore. Ah, uh, yes. I made chef de partie, so I'm the saucier at the restaurant I work at. So that's exciting. And I'm going to go on a cool date in a couple weeks with my wife. It's her birthday. I'm going to take her to the restaurant I work at because she's never eaten there. And I've never eaten as a guest there. I feel like taking your girlfriend to the place that you work at usually isn't like the fanciest date. But when you work at a really fancy restaurant where like if you order something under $50, you're you're a weirdo or something like it's it's different. <laughs> You're just order. You're basically just ordering the appetizers at that. <laughs> yeah. Entrees. Yeah, I think we're gonna go for the. I think we're gonna do the ten course uh, chef's tasting menu because there's some pretty cool stuff on there. Order the steak tartare as an appetizer because I want her to try that, and I think it's delicious. So I'm excited. Yeah, awesome. Uh, both doing good. Last thing we do before we get into the card of the week is the next big popper event is a. Popper PTQ on February 22nd. So if you've got those 40 qualifier points, do that. Uh, and if not, you have the up until February 22nd to get them. Yeah, just under a month. So get that bread. Who knows? By the time this comes out, that could be way out of date. Like I, By the time we released the, the previous episode, because we skipped a week, um, things just didn't work out for recording. Yeah. And I just didn't post the episode until like the next week. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't have to edit that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Some of the, the news could be kind of out of date. I, we announced the, the January 26th one on that episode and we're recording this one and I'm posting that other episode on January 26th. Yeah. So let's try that again. It, uh, uh, yeah. That's in like two weeks. So get that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. But uh card of the week card of the week card of the week i chose this so, card of the week it is omen of the dead this is a card from theros beyond to death that we didn't put in our top eight and i think that that might be a mistake it's still real easy um it could be just people trying it out you know new card smell type of things but i've actually seen some promise in this card and we're gonna go into why uh so omen of the dead is a single black for an enchantment with flash when omen of the dead enters the battlefield return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand and it has the ability of two and a black sacrifice omen of the dead scry two the reason 
I think this is seeing play in some decks is one, it has some synergies with Core Skyfisher. I haven't seen that, but I've seen people talking about that on Reddit. So that's something that we didn't really take account of. And the the reason that I actually think it's better than we gave it credit for is that it can go in the mono black deck because it counts towards the devotion to black. And if you don't believe that that's a, a worthy reason to put a card in your deck that is maybe not as powerful as a standalone card as something else, Oubliette is played. That's a three mana removal spell. I can count the amount of three mana removal spells on one hand that are played in Popper. Oubliette. Uh, I mean, if you're counting like Swirling Sandstorm and, oh, but and that's Pestilence. Funny. You said three mana. Okay, but like three or more, it's like <laughs> almost non-existent, but Oubliette but is on that list. Sandstorm and, and, and the other one that you said... Why, pestilence why, pestilence yeah like the most okay iconic popper sweeper those are like mass removal spells i feel like those are in very different camps than three mana targeted removal on a single creature mm -hmm. like i i find it hard to be able to compare oubliette to those so like yeah oubliette is getting played at three mana when the bar for playing things above three mana in this format are the two best sweepers yeah, I can also think of, like, Obnixilis' Cruelty as one other card, but that's, like, the end of the list, and that's a sideboard card. So my, my point is that the Mono Black deck very much cares about its devotion to black, and this being instant speed, and let's, let's face it, like, it's a one-for-one, one, that's fine, but the second ability, those games go long, it's a control deck. You're going to be able to scry, and by the time that you get to scry, if you have multiple of these in your deck, it's like you get to, later on, you get to scry a few, like, my opponent was playing three of these. Uh, one of the interactions that was really big in that matchup was they had a Fairy Macabre, they switched to Fairy Macabre as their Graveyard Hate spell, and they were, at instant speed, casting Omen of the Dead, return Fairy Macabre, get your two things. And that was... That's gas. That was pretty good. So, I think that this might have more, this definitely has more legs than we gave it credit for, and it will be seen if this has enough, enough power to it to see, like, conventional main deck play. Yeah, I think, uh, as is tradition here, after a set review, we always choose one card that uh, sees an amount of play that we kind of overlooked, and this is, I think, the one. So yeah, keep your eye out for Omen of the Dead main topic thanks deep voice all right so today's main topic we're going to be talking about cube mostly we're going to be talking about popper cube because this is a popper podcast but to kind of start off we're just going to go kind of deep into what cube is how you can get started into building your own cube if that's something you're interested in trying to do uh, and and a lot of those things i know i've thought about building cubes multiple multiple times and i've e i've even designed at least two or three on an app i have on my phone and i just every time i, I start it and i design this cube i'm like this is so awesome and then i think about getting into getting all the cards and then managing that collection and it, it, it's pretty daunting i have i've yet to even start so outside of just like designing the cube which is why i do i'm building a battle box hmm. i have a popper battle box which is maybe we'll do an episode about battle box one day but <laughs> i think that people would love that i see so many posts about battle boxes on reddit yeah it's just to me it's much easier to manage you know i it's it's like 180 cards you can fit it in a little box i can bring it around with me it's really easy cubes are kind of daunting so if this is something you've ever thought about doing at home but i've always been kind of scared off by the idea Hopefully this episode can give you some advice, some tips, some tricks, and especially coming from Sean, who manages his own popper cube. Um, and it, it, it's it's a blast. I love cube. Cube is absolutely my favorite way to play magic. I love limited, and cube is just like the funnest kind of limited. I love cube. So I'm excited for this episode. So let's just get right into it. First off, what the heck is cube for anyone who is newer to the game, maybe doesn't know exactly what cube is. The way I describe it to people when I'm 
telling them that I have a cube is it's like a pre-built draft set where all of the cards that you're going to draft, you have just in a box. When you go to play cube, you sort them into 15 card packs instead of your normal magic card packs. So usually a pod would be eight people. So the minimum is going to be 360 cards. So it's a 360 card collection. Uh, they're usually powerful cards, but I've seen cubes that are really just draft stuff people have thrown into a box. Uh, am I missing anything here? No, no, I think that's actually the best point. Your cube doesn't have to be vintage power nine. You can do really anything you want. Build it out of the bulk rares that you have in your boxes lying around. Build it out of your, your trade binders. I designed a cons cube. Because I love drafting cons of Tarkir. That's probably my favorite draft set of all time. It's like up there with like Dominaria and Modern Horizons and Modern Masters 1 as like my favorite draft format. So I designed what I felt like a, a sweet cons of Tarkir cube would be. And it, so you can really do whatever you want with it. You know, your cube should be large enough, like Sean said, for at least eight people to draft three 15 card packs. So you build those packs from the cards in your cube, you shuffle them up, make them random, give everyone three 15 card packs. Uh, so at minimum, your cube should be about 360 cards, but a lot of cubes are a lot bigger. Uh, 450, 540 are generally uh, the most popular sizes. So this kind of allows for extra people to draft, like say you've got nine or 10 people, you can have more people in the draft, but it also allows you to kind of create this unique experience every time you draft where it's not every card in the draft is getting opened. You know, you know exactly what's going to be in the draft and that someone's going to get a specific archetype. It's going to be different. You know, I think about in Vintage Cube, I think that cube on Magic Online is like 720 cards or something. Like it's, it's a big cube. Mm -hmm. And so it's like pack one, pick one. Oh, there's the Splinter Twin. Ooh, do I take this? And then what if I don't see Deceiver Exarch or whatever? You know, and you've kind of got to make the, the way those options of like, well, what if the payoff doesn't come? Because it's not here. It's not even in the draft. So I think I think it adds a fun element if you can make it a little bigger. But uh, 360 is where you should start so that you can draft with at least eight people. And that's where I, I've decided I'm going to end my if you want to find my cube, you can literally Google Lobert Popper Cube, and it's the first result every time. Um, it says Lobber when you look on Google, just because I think there's a character limit on how many, like what they title the, the cube. Maybe I just didn't put the T on there the first time, and I've never noticed. Who knows? But yeah, look for Lobert Popper Cube, and Lobber Popper Cube will come up. Um, but I went for 360 cards. My goal is to make this like a Popper Power Cube. I want this to be the the most powerful 360 cards in Popper in a limited format. And I think we'll talk about that a bit later of like all of the constructed cards might not be as good in Cube. I think one more note, um, if you're going to try to make a cube of 720, one of the upsides to doing that is that allows for two eight person pods. So, mm. I mean, if you have a big party of 16 or whatever, you can get two drafts going at once, or you can draft, play that draft, set all those cards aside, and you don't even have to shuffle up again. You've got 360 more cards ready to go for a second draft. Mm. Boom. I, I get disappointed in the fact that, like, if I had extra cards, maybe no one would get Mold Rifter. Maybe no one would get Crypt Rats. And that's really disappointing to me. Like, there's whole archetypes that center around one to two cards. And if those aren't in there, someone could have just been, like, they took the risk and they lost. I would rather that somebody else took those cards and so that they, you know, they weren't rewarded because somebody else was actively hating them out. But I can see how it would make it stale if you were playing your cube all the time. I get to cube, like, I own one and I only do it, like, once, twice a year. Uh, that's just because I'm antisocial. And I hate planning things. Yeah, I usually have to organize them when we do them. And very rarely do I have time off 
to be able to go cube draft. So we did one cube draft. I think it was just like a couple weeks ago we did a cube draft. Yeah. Uh, we got we got some people together. We got eight together and we drafted and it was so much fun. It was funny too because the store owner that we drafted with was like, this was so fun. Oh, Popper is the best. We should do this every Wednesday night. Come on, guys. And, and we, me and Sean were just both like, <laughs> uh, I might have time off during spring break. <laughs> In yeah March, at the end of march like maybe um and i think the time the last time we had done it like the last time me and you had cubed together god was like i mean before the podcast before the time of the podcast <laughs> really like three years ago yeah i remember it too because there were four of us um it was me you josh hubbard and glenn and we we did a seal because we didn't have people to draft. That was the last time I played with your cube. That was I, like three or four uh, years ago. Because I do play it with my D&D group every once in a while when we want a week off. I'll bring it and we'll do that. So I get to play more often. So I, I, I didn't know it was so long ago. Jeez. Yeah, it's been a while. But anyway, I guess that's also like a beauty of owning a cube. It's kind of like owning a legacy deck. It's always going to be good, You're, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know, maybe you don't get enough time, like all the time to play with it, but you're guaranteed that when you do have time to go and play and you get people together to play, your cards are still going to be good. It's not like a new card modern, came out and changed modern, everything. Yeah, my modern is it Phoenix deck got banned because Faithless Looting. And now I'm like, oh, I don't have a modern deck anymore to go play modern. Mm -hmm. you know, like your cube will always be good. Even if some of the cards might be out of date or there are better new cards you could put in, it doesn't matter. It's still going to play and be fun. So pretty, pretty big upside. If you're got a busy schedule to own a cube. That kind of brings up a good point of my cube has banned cards in it. That's perfectly fine to me. Like all, I think if something makes the ban list, it pretty much automatically goes in the cube. I think the only one not in here is cranial plating. That might change. It's not because it's too powerful. It's because I don't have like artifact lands. And so like it would be like plus two or three and then it's just a fair magic card. And what's the point? Yeah. So that's a brief, uh, not a very brief introduction, but an introduction on what cube is and maybe why you should be incentivized to build one. Let's get into kind of the nitty gritty of like crafting your cube, structuring your cube. Let's start talking about color dispersion and, and why that's important in a cube. Okay, I've gone for a pretty structured, like I've seen people with more or less of a certain color. Um, in a 360 card cube, I have, each color has 60 cards. And then between multicolor and colorless, that makes up the rest of it. And I don't care what goes into either, as long as it's fairly even of like, I have a bounce land for each color and each multicolor has, there's some colors I have one card, like Azorius, uh, blue, white, I have just Curse of Chains. The rest of the blue-white cards kind of suck. I didn't want to force them in here when I'm like nitpicking like slots to find room for really good things. Like Cube Tutor keeps a track of all of the changes that you've ever made. And I've got some really, really good cards. Like I'm this close to cutting Desert, which is the, the land that pings things after they hit you but yeah i say 60 cards out of a 360 cube so what what percent is, is that 60 16 uh so that's six a little uh, 16 and a half percent a little over that of each color but i do think that you should keep all of the colors even and all of the the color pairings even like i just went through a big overhaul of taking out a bunch of multicolor blue black cards um, I made the mistake of there were some color there were some cards in my blue section that either had kicker or flashback for black mana. You can probably figure out what those are, but those were in the blue section when they should have been in the multicolor section, in my opinion. And I think that imbalanced the cube to be to skew more blue black. And I think that was evidenced in playing the cube a few times. It could definitely support two blue black control players. And that, that was a little too much. And it was only because I think I had like an extra three or four cards that that kind of forced you into those colors. It is a powerful color combo, though. Yeah, and I've even found the same thing with like artifacts. So if the artifact has like an act a colored activation or cost of activation, I would put that card into that color. You know, so if like Aether Spellbomb or Pyrite Spellbomb, that's a blue and a red and a red spell. 
right there. Those aren't colorless spells, in my opinion, because they go into that color, right? Yeah, that... you co- kind of go by the color identity, like in Commander, more. Yeah, that's a, that, yeah, very. That's a very good way to put it. You know, you want to look at the color identity of the card, and even though Forbidden Alchemy is blue, it's two and a blue to cast. It has that black flashback, so it's going to fit in the blue black strategy. So that that should factor into how many blue and black gold spells you have and there are exceptions to that where like there's a specific card i'm thinking of i wish i could remember the name it's a morph card it is red it costs five usually but you can morph it and then flip it for discarding a card nowhere in that card are you required to pay red mana so that's potentially a colorless card and so that could fit in your colorless section yeah so again, it's really important to try to balance that color. Generally, you do want to have that equal amount of cards in each color. Like Sean said, he does 60 of each color. I mean, this isn't the hard rule. Sometimes it could be correct to have fewer cards in a color for like balancing of power level purposes. Um, I think that in the Vintage Cube, I could be wrong about this, but uh, the Magic Online Vintage Cube has more blue cards in it than any other color. And that's just because of how powerful blue is and how often blue is drafted that they kind of had to weight blue heavier so that everyone could get that experience. Like it's vintage. Everyone wants to play with ancestral recall and mana drain and all those cards. So everyone's going to gravitate towards blue. So that cube is kind of skewed towards blue. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just the way that cube is. So it, it really all just depends on the kind of experience you want your your cube to be to have Mm -hmm. and and kind of getting that balance to get the cube to play the way you want it to play so let's talk a quick minute about crafting archetypes in the cube because this is sort of i think the most important part outside of balancing and balancing your color pie how is your cube going to play like what kind of strategies are people going to be going for what do you want what experience do you want the people who play your cube to have and archetypes are going to be the backbone of all that. So I think that there's the way I did it and a right way and a wrong way. <laughs> so the way I did it, I did not have archetypes in mind. I just put in the best cards that I could find into every slot and archetypes emerged. And then as I archetypes emerged, I started skewing like, okay, well, this needs a little bit more support and this card doesn't fit into the any any existing archetypes. So its power level in the cube is low. Say like Benevolent Bodyguard. Benevolent Bodyguard is good. Very powerful magic card. It's the single white for a 1-1. One, one. You can sacrifice it and give, a tar- or give target creature protection from the color of your choice. Very good. But what archetypes does it go into? It's kind of like a Protect the Queen card. Uh, It's usually more of a combo card, and there's not a lot of that going on in the cube. Like, there is the presence of Gond combo, and there's a Heroic, Heroic and Boggles and stuff like that, but it's not really doing anything, although it is powerful. So that's a card that I, you know, I start looking at, and I cut that one down in favor of some other white one drop, because I also have it balanced where every color should have some number of one drops uh, between five to seven and right now white is sitting at six and i plan on upgrading that card to some other white one drop i think i didn't have the lagana band trailblazer in this before and that's a crime so that's that's what i'm swapping out there okay so that's that's the way you did it what's the wrong way to do it i'm curious that's what i want to know you go too hard into archetypes and basically put an entire deck into the cube i think the prime example of this is something like slivers if you don't have like changelings supporting like i have a tribal cube where tribes matter and i support tribes then your slivers deck doesn't overlap with anything else they're just subpar bears to everyone else and to the one person they're just literal gold i really like these versatile cards which can go in any number of decks um, i'm just going to pick one at random say like elusive spell fist the colorless and a blue one three uh, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus one, plus O, oh, and unblockable until end of turn. This is going to fit into, I think, literally anything. Like, if you're a control deck, it's going to be able to get in and deal damage while you're doing other things. It's a good blocker. There's a storm archetype that this fits perfectly into. There's tempo. Like, I try to have as many of those overlaps as possible instead of, like, 
Torture existence is a thing. I have to put madness into my cube. Well, I did, but that's because it's pretty easy to support, like, discarding cards, right? So, like, there are choices that I've made that fit into just this is this archetype, but I try to have as many overlapping spells as possible because you, I want every color to work with every other color and itself. So versatility, I think, is is key. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think that's pretty on the nail. For me, when I've designed a cube, uh, cubes in the past, I've always started with the 10 color pairs and, and just kind of tried to think of a theme that I wanted in each color pair. So maybe blue-white was like a, a flicker, enter the battlefield theme. And then blue-black was reanimator and red-white was aggro and red black was madness or just whatever you know think of think of like specific themes you want in in there and then the next thing is to kind of try to create sub themes so blue white was etbs and flicker but i also want like a blue white flyers deck to exist so i prioritize flying creatures in blue and white that have enter the battlefield effects so that even if you don't get those flicker payoffs, you know, you don't find the the Mist Meadow Witch or whatever, you still have like decent creatures that fly. And that's kind of an archetype. Like I'm just playing all the best flying creatures. Hopefully you can block them. And so I like, that's kind of how I've started in the past when I've created and designed cubes. I do think um, your point though, about including cards that are versatile is really important. So having, having crossover between them. So, you know, say my my blue black theme, I want the blue cards to overlap with the white and the black, so that my blue black and my blue white cards can be interchangeable, in a sense. Yeah, I think that hits hits on a point of I really prioritize cards that have generic symbols in their cost. Like for example, Sign in Blood is black black, while Knight's Whisper is colorless and a black. Yes, Sign in Blood. In a mono black deck in constructed, like when you know what your deck is going to be, is it's better, period. You want to be able to target the other person if that just kills them. That's just gravy. But in cube, everyone is going to be multicolor. Basically, everyone's going to be multicolor. So Knight's Whisper, being colorless and a black, goes in everything else. Like, I think color weight is the word of how many colored pips are in a, in the cost. That's very important while building a cube. I think even that fits into talking about like color dispersion, um, trying to even out the color pips, not just cards. You want to make sure that you do have cards that are castable when that card is the splash color. So you're predominantly a blue deck. You have a few black cards. Sign and Blood might not be a good card, but Night nice Whisper, yeah. certainly playable, like very playable. I think your blue, your blue blazed deck, blue blazed. Black based? Blue no, I meant blue based. Blue based deck because you want to splash the black and sign a mm. blood the harder splash. I just couldn't say blue bla blue blue based. Okay. I think black is definitely the main offender with that though. Black loves black. Like it doesn't play well with others most of the time. Like <laughs> so many like black just loves to put as many black symbols on their cards as possible. And uh, that's, I think, something to watch out for. Like, I just took out one of my favorite cards of all time, Tendrils of Corruption, which is the three and a black deal damage to target creature equal to the number of swamps you control. Man, I love that card, but, and its color weight isn't too high, but it, it had to count the number of swamps. And if you're drafting and you're thinking like, I don't know how much into black I'm going to be, this could just be... I have seven mana out and this does three damage like eh, maybe not worth it so i think that's also like a color dispersion thing yeah i do think that one more pretty important point when you're thinking about archetypes are cards that don't fit into any one archetype like more like vanilla creatures uh you know i'm thinking about your you know your hill giants you're just generic beaters or removal spells these are the spells that that aren't necessary for any archetype but they're the filler cards that are going to fill out the, your deck you're not going to be able to create a super focused deck yeah you know? 
And so you're going to need cards that can fill out your cube slots. And and let's face it, you don't want to be putting in cards that fit into another archetype into your deck because, frankly, they're probably not going to be very good. You know, that's where you're going to be looking to pick up your, your random removal spell or your draw spell or your 2-2 two, two flyer for three, you know, just whatever you need to fill out your curve. Like, those are things that you're going to want in your cube. All right, so that's sort of a very basic introduction to cube and starting to build your own cube uh if you want to learn more there's so many resources online i got a lot of these show notes that i did just by googling it and like reading old articles like there was an article by gavin verhey uh, melissa de Tora wrote a good article so there's a lot of good resources uh caleb gannon on youtube he is sort of the cube aficionado in my opinion so if you want to know a lot about cube you can go check out his stuff he's always with every set updating cubes and telling you what you should be doing with new cards from new sets so there are tons of great resources out there if you want to learn more about this this is not a very in-depth this is kind of just like skimming the surface you know just to get you started into into your cube experience but uh right now i think we just want to talk about popper cube and uh, we're going to talk about Sean's cube, a lot of the decisions he's made as far as card choices, etc. So, buckle up. Um, I I see your questions here, and I'm actually eager to answer those. Do you want to just get into that? Yeah, let's do it. We um, had a few questions uh, from listeners. We put this out on Twitter. What are the things you'd want to know about Popper? We had a few good responses, so we're going to talk about some of those. The first one I see is from David Gunn. On uh, Twitter asked, is it okay to put Infect in a Popper cube? And he followed that question up with the eh face. Yeah. Sideways. I think he was just in jest, but also I think that's a fun question because I think it's something we've talked about. Okay, yeah. I, I'm going to say no. I haven't ever done it, but I think it's just too easy to just steal games and make them unfun. I built this cube with with the idea of I'm not going to keep anything out of this cube that I think is too powerful. And then Infect has been my exception to that rule. I put Invigorate and a whole enchantment strategy into this. And that could quickly just become turn two, turn three kills in a cube. <laughs> you see, my opinion on it is that the opposite experience would occur and that the person trying to draft infect would have a miserable time because how many, like how many good infect creatures are there really? There's glistener elf, there's blighted agent, but you got one of each of those and you're really kind of playing with some kind of mediocre creatures. There's Iker claw mirror and cyst bear and rot wolf as well. Yeah. Those are pretty mediocre in my, as much removal as the popper cube has. I just see someone trying to draft this, it not coming together the way they want it and having a miserable experience because it's probably not that great. And then the one time someone gets it to go off, that would be kind of a cool thing to see. Mm. Uh, but that's my I know opinion. I know how strong the Boggles deck is. And when when you see that they overlap, I I think that's kind of scary that you could be drafting Boggles and then just be like, "Oh, sweet and infect creature, jam that in there." And then just win random games. I, I want to support everything fully. And if I were to support an infect strategy fully, which I think it's already basically like optimized for an infect strategy. Uh, the infect creatures. Yeah. If I just threw those in there, I think it would maybe be one of, it could be one of the strongest things in here. Maybe I'm delusional and yeah, the removal is just good enough and it's hard to get your creature that big and you could just, you know, split your damage between normal damage and infect damage and never get there. So maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I've been scared to do it and I don't want to cut the slots to do it. Like the idea of having to cut a, a green one drop. Ugh, no. So there's the verdict. I think we're both a no, but I think for different reasons, I just don't think it would be super fun to draft that and, and just have to deal with the frustration of it not coming together the way it was supposed to. 
and then for and, and for the off time when someone randomly can win with infect i just don't think it would be worth it but yeah and there are other cards there's white infect creatures like if you wanted to put that and like that is a whole archetype and i'm going to support it i think it could be done and i think it could be done well but i i'm afraid of it being done better than the rest of the archetypes it's just being too much okay yeah so our next question came from jonah yoshinobu and jonah kind of prefaced it by explaining his background with cube he loves vintage cube he loves drafting super powerful strategies and just playing the most powerful cards that he can and his question was more about what sort of powerful strategies can a popper cube contain will this be on par power level wise with things like legacy or vintage cube or is it going to feel like a more normal booster draft environment it's definitely head and shoulders above any limited format you've ever played in like the power level of all of, like cumulative power level of all of the cards it's more powerful than i think any of the masters sets kind of a, a set that's like everything's supposed to work together and these are the most powerful cards of all time you know at common I definitely think that this that the power is here. And then what kind of archetypes? I think I think it's time for me to just kind of go through each of my colors and what kind of archetypes they contain. Does that sound like yeah. a good idea? I think so. I want to know all about your cube. So next time I draft it, I have a leg up. Okay. Uh, so white, of course, has white weenie strategy. There's plenty of ways to buff up your creatures. Rally the Peasants is in here. Righteous Charge, which gives all your creatures plus two, plus two until end of turn. Uh, Marshalling Cry is in here. And then there's also a bunch of creatures. Like, I just added the the Hero of the Pride, which every time you give it a plus, or you every time you target it with a spell, you give your whole team plus one, plus oh. And that's overlapping with the Heroic Archetype. The, her the Heroic Archetype, of course, overlaps with the Boggles Archetype, so you've got a bunch of good enchantments, uh, a bunch of anthem effects, protection spells, and that's basically it. Just anthem effects, protection spells, removal, and pump spells, if I haven't said that yet. That's basically all white, white is. And then just like a whole bunch of token producers and just like solid white creatures. For blue, a lot of blue is just like, it is an engine for drawing you cards it has the flyover strategy. All of the creatures are going to draw you card or fly over. Then for the spells, just tons and tons of draw spells, counter spells. Enough draw spells that y you can play Storm in this. And it does have all of the, like, Gush, Gataxian, Probe. Uh, what's the banned one? Frantic Search. Yeah, it's Frantic Search, all the cantrips, uh, some ways to give your creature unblockable. And I think Blue is heavily drafted because it's... It's a really versatile thing. If you have removal in another color or you're trying to go kind of fast, like the flying is, is pretty dang good. And the tempo in Vapor Snag, Repulse, like bounce spells is pretty powerful um, as well. as just, it just provides an engine. Um, and then black, there's a lot of support for like a tortured existence strategy. So there's creatures that love to be in the graveyard or like to get sacrificed. Basically, the whole deck of mono black control is in here of like just value creatures. Like every color is going to have as many value creatures as I can possibly cram into them. Creatures that make your opponent discard, killer creatures, and then, you know, like the delve guys for like big finishers or whatever. And then black just has tons of removal, ways of bringing stuff back from the graveyard, draw spells, discard spells. That, that's basically black. Uh, like it's, It has a lot of removal in it. Red? I've actually had complaints from... These are, these are players that don't typically play a lot of magic. Like, they're, they're my D&D group that plays magic when I play magic with them once every six months or whatever. That red was too focused. All of the creatures are aggressive in red. Of course. And they're the most aggressive, like, good creatures I could find. Uh, and then there's just a ton of burn spells. So if you... Like, we, we play sealed usually because there's only four people. And each person just grabs a quarter of the cube and, and plays that. And sometimes somebody can build an entirely mono red deck and has been able to play... In a 40-card deck, I've seen 12 lands and they just go 
like for a blitz strategy and that's i think that's pretty cool uh but i, th I think in draft that doesn't usually end up happening when we played our draft everyone had red dregs like everybody was hate i had to last pick red cards because nobody seemed to want it yeah so well the red cards are very powerful and I mean, I remember drafting and, and seeing red cards coming through and just going, man, if someone's drafting mono red to, to my left or whatever, they're, they're getting hooked up. This deck is sweet and powerful and they're probably going to win the draft. But it's kind of boring. Everyone wanted to go for the big flashy fun thing. They wanted to do cool stuff instead of just like red one drop, red one drop, smash, lightning bolt. I felt like it was a missed opportunity for a lot of people to pick up, like, oh, I'm going to splash red, I'm going to get rem red removal spells. I don't think anyone even did that. Like, mm -hmm. So there was a whole like section of burn and removal that just wasn't played. The store owner had red in his deck, so he was probably rolling in whatever he wanted. Yeah, he, he played uh, Is It Blitz, and it was yeah. insane. But yeah, the I found that in Popper Cube... The Blitz strategy overlaps with enough things, like, I have Storm in here, so Storm and Blitz go hand in hand. If you are a failed Storm deck, you're a really good Blitz deck, since your creatures just, like, care about Storm. And also, the, the Blitz deck also can really benefit from the heroic cards, where it gives you protection or just makes your creature really big. So I think there's a, a lot of overlap there. I'm always looking for value creatures to add to red since there's not that many. Uh, but I have pretty much every single one that I can think of in here. I am I was really excited for the 3-1 with Escape, uh, Underworld Rage Hound. That, uh, that's definitely a value creature that I can jam into this over something that's just flat aggressive and doesn't really help with anything. Um, I have Goblin Synergy cards in here, but... I don't go out of my way to add goblins to red. There are just enough good goblins that they're just fine cards. Like my example is like Goblin Sledder. Goblin Sledder as a 1-1 a one, one for 1 that can sacrifice a goblin and give target creature plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. Even if this is just a 1 drop in a cube that can sacrifice to pump something up and maybe win, win something, that's fine. You don't need to force a bunch of like dragon fodders into your cube i think that basically covers red i guess red also has anthems and then last color green green of course has ramp color fixing um, and then just like value creatures that can go into as many decks as possible it does have some hexproof creatures that you can build a boggle strategy on top of there's a bunch of enchantments that do also feed into that it's got fight spells uh and life gain it does have both weather the storm and pulse Marasa, and there's some other life gain cards but yeah just big guys ramp spells and value i guess as well as some support for your torture's existence strategy and then when we move on to multicolor i don't know how to talk about this but I think every every color has at most five cards, and that's including the bounce lands. That's what I've chosen to be the lands that I want to put into the cube. There's a few reasons for that. One, I get to put one or two land destruction spells in the cube, and that actually gives them like purpose without having to have like a land destruction strategy. And then I think that they just smooth out the games where you know you can get to higher amounts of mana by putting these in your deck. Uh, even if you're not in that color combination, like if you weren't in, say, Azorius, blue-white, you would never draft the, the blue-white gain land. But if you were a blue X deck, you might get Azorius Chancery just because you know that that, that land is going to produce two mana and get you to higher amounts of mana. So I think it gives all of the land slots in the cube a little bit of extra oomph and purpose even if that color combination isn't being drafted. I do stick as much as possible to the idea that if I can put a card in here that can be played in a monocolor deck, like Gift of Orzova, which has hybrid mana symbols, those are really, really good and versatile. So I, I don't want to force somebody into a certain strategy, so I really like those. It's really hard to talk about multicolor all at once, but this is really where I choose archetypes 
like archetypes are very important for your multicolor. Like since I want storm to be a thing, my is it cards are a little bit storm based. Like there's the blitz strategy if I put both Nivix Cyclops and We Dragonauts in here, but then there's also like Goblin Electromancer. So I chose that as like these are all storm cards or blitz cards for say Golgari. I put like Grizzly Salvage and Putrid Leech. Like Putrid Leech, if you're just building a value deck, is good. But then Grizzly Salvage really is like a Tortured Existence or Graveyard deck strategy. Like I think most of your color combinations, this is where you decide like what this specific archetype is going to be. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, that's where you can kind of focus more of your power for an archetype at. And, yeah. and like kind of like how we talked about like choosing those themes and the color pairs. This is where you can focus on that a lot and then have more of your versatility in the individual colors because those can overlap. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I have colorless cards. I have 26 colorless cards in my cube. There's a lot, a lot of color fixing in here. I I did want to make color fixing as, as good as possible in here. So I have like Lotus Petal, Arkham's Astrolabe, Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star, Golden Egg, Prophetic Prism, I think that's it as far as as color fixing goes. So I want a color fixing to be very, very good. It's it doesn't subtract a whole lot and everything like like golden egg recently got added because cards like uh Core Sky Fisher or Invasive Species, they want this. It, you know, any any kind of thing that's gonna bounce something to your hand. I think that just enables that and so multipurpose, it's Great. It's also life gain if you need that kind of thing. Uh, and then for colorless creatures, I actually only have three, which those have slowly gotten whittled down just because they're never as good as a colored creature, but everybody wants them. I just haven't found that many that I'm like passionate enough about. Like the three I have is Renegade Freighter, which is the, the three mana vehicle. I have Eldrazi Devastator, which is an eight mana, eight, nine for with Trample. And then I have Ulamog's Crusher, which is, of course, the 8-8 eight, eight for 8 with Annihilator 2. So two huge bombs for anybody, and I've seen anybody take these cards. Like, I've seen a mono red deck, which I totally disagreed with, cast Eldrazi Devastator just because they had, like, the removal to keep the game going and their plan didn't come out. They are just like, okay, backup plan. And it's like, okay, oops. <laughs> but... I don't know what to give you advice on these because I've also, I've been struggling with this. Like I used to have like Ornithopter in here and stuff, which is fine. Anybody can do that, but it is going to skew more towards like strategies that can pants them up with equipment or enchantments or something like that or storm. It was decent in storm plus one storm count. And then of course I have the other seven lands that don't fit into any of the multicolor. Uh, Terramorphic Expanse, Evolving Wilds. Ash Barons, uh, Cave of Temptation, and then like just weird colorless ones like Quicksand Desert and Haunted Fengraph. So I couldn't just like, I don't have it like written down anywhere. Like these are my strategies, but I do know what each color's kind of trying to do. And it's not that far off from the way they're intended. Like if I don't have bounce spells or counter spells in blue, I'm doing blue wrong in my opinion. Um, like I... For a long time, I agonized over this because I only had one Death Touch creature in my black cards. I eventually cut it because it was by far the worst card in black. It was the Enchantment Eidolon. It just didn't end up being that good. So black is missing that keyword, but uh, I guess I do still have Stinkweed Imp. I don't know. Like, I do try to get the flavor of each color into that color somewhere. So moving on... There's another topic that we didn't address, but you're going to run into when you're building your cube. Like we talked about color balance, but then there's also balance within a color. So each of my colors has 60 cards and I try to keep the creature count at 30 cards or more. So 50% or more. I think that's about what Wizards has it at. Like I've, I've found, and I only do the commons. I don't really care if like there's an imbalanced number of rares and uncommons, maybe uncommons, but all of their sets are about a little over 50% creatures, and I wanted to stay true to that. So 
Like, white has 34 creatures, blue has 32 creatures, black has 30, red has 32, green has 33, and that will fluctuate a little bit when I add or remove cards. But sometimes I can't add a card because I don't want to make the creature count go up or down, and I can't cut any creatures. Like, it's not better than any of my two drops. I uh, can't put this card in here. Um, I won't just stack up my two drops. So that kind of brings up, like, you should make sure there's a plan for each color to go all the way from one mana to tons of mana. Every, every single color has at least a five cost creature. Red has five cost creatures uh, in Flurry of Horns, Scourge Devil, and Slash Panther. Yeah, in red, they're not going to be as good. Uh, like, really, Slash Panther kind of, it's a, it's a four drop. And the other two, you've probably heard of Flurry of Horns, but you've probably never heard of Scourge Devil. But I, I put it in there because I want each color to have its own like scale all the way up like i don't want to have too many two drops like red will have more two drops than any other color except for maybe white because that's just its strategy and then like green has like a, a disproportionate amount of oh, i guess i fixed this it used to have tons and tons of three drops for some reason um and i've i've kind of fixed that up a little bit but i i'm very conscientious of how many of each mana cost there are i'm looking at this right now and i'm like geez white has a lot of four drops but all of these cards are great so i'm not cutting it i also try to balance instant sorceries enchantments and a couple of the strategies have artifacts or lands in them like blue has mantle of the tides and mystic sanctuary but white doesn't have a white land i feel like that would take away from the power level of white to cram in one of these lands i can't think of a good one at all there's like the crossroads like cabria crossroads that you gain to life when you play it but i mean that's i guess kind of respectable when you have bounce lands but white is such it's, it's a pretty tight color i'm already like scraping together <laughs> like can i fit this card like it's it's pretty tight and then i guess one one last thing is I'll ask you about this one, because I'm on the fence. How do you feel about hate cards? Like Hydra Blast or Pyroblast. Or Disenchant or Relic. I think they're good. I think they're necessary. Yeah, I think it adds an element to your games because it makes you want to sideboard. It makes you have to think about, oh, this Pyroblast could be really, really good. Blue's popular in the cube. I'm bound to play against Blue. Do I want to take this for a sideboard slot or take this other card that may or may not even make it into my deck? Yeah, you know, I, I think it has a fun dynamic having having sideboard cards, like uh, cards that are like specifically like destroy target flyer. Maybe you won't play that in your main deck, but it's a nice sideboard option to have. I think they're good. Okay, that's a good take because my cube is very, very light on sideboard cards. And that's been like a critique people have given me of like, they get some they get an artifact and it's just there forever they get an enchantment and i if i'm a green deck i should be able to blow up their enchantment there there are cards it's just probably not as many as there should be and then when i see them i'm not that impressed like for enchantment removal in white i put kami of ancient law which is just a, a two drop bear that blows up an enchantment like you can sacrifice it and blow up an enchantment yeah i there think that's probably the best way to do it though you know have a card that's versatile like um Return to Nature destroys artifacts and enchantments, but it can also exile a card from a graveyard. Relic right. of Progenitus also just cantrips, and it's probably just a fine include in your deck no matter what. Uh, Kami of Ancient Law, it could blow up an artifact or enchantment, but a lot of times you just want a curve filler in your, in your deck. You want a two-drop. And so I think finding cards that can do that so you don't have to have two or three disenchants like just literal disenchants in your cube you can have one disenchant and a bunch of creatures that have disenchant tacked on yeah i mean the, the list is real short of creatures that like fill that i think kami of ancient law i think there's also like a few clones of kami i try not to put just renames of cards like just clones of it like i want you draft a card you get that unique effect uh, that's kind of the approach i've taken to it i know that some people are like hmm the Find horde elves lana war elves elvish mystic great we have three three green one drops that are great they are great i don't think it's as fun but 
Who knows? Maybe you want to make that elf strategy real good. Yeah. And, and I definitely don't think that you need a lot. I don't think that everyone should be able to sideboard and have amazing sideboard options every single game. But I think it adds an element of, of skill to the draft where a, a player now needs to prioritize sideboard cards, you know, and that player's going to get rewarded, you know, if it's like, well, I had the option between taking this disenchant or taking a random creature that I already kind of had. It would just be filler. Like I've already got kind of that space filled with other creatures. I guess I'll take this disenchant because I know that there are powerful whatever enchantments. And then you play against that person that has journey to nowhere and you're able to sideboard in your disenchant and it wins you your game. And I think that adds a nice element of skill. I don't think there should be a lot, yeah. but I, it's good to have a few things like that there. I think that they, they make for fun, interactive games. And I think that they reward players for drafting well. Okay. You brought up Hydro and Pyroblast. I, s I don't have those in my cube uh, because I think that they're too narrow um, in that they, they're they specifically one color. I, I don't like that. Where things like Disenchant and Blow Up Artifacts or Enchantments, that that's pretty broad. Everybody should have some number of artifacts and enchantments in their deck, most likely. It might be safe enough to even main deck these cards. So I think those are really easy to put into the cube. Yeah, I like that. Wicker Bow Elder is my favorite. Yeah, that's an example of a really good one, where if you do have the payoff to blow up an artifact or enchantment, it's really, really great. Otherwise, it's just like a fine creature to fill your curve. So the last thing we want to kind of touch on before we check out for the night is managing your cube. This is a lot of cards. You don't want to... It, it's really hard to keep track of it. I, you probably don't want to write it down on a piece of paper or type it out or something. There are some really good resources out there where you can manage your cube. Sean uses Cube Tutor. That's probably the best one. I use an app called Decked Builder, which has a lot of good tools. You can, you know, not only build decks, but you can manage your collection. And it also gives you prices. So you can have your cube in a file, in a single file on the app. And it will tell you, you know, if you're building this cube and you've already logged your collection into the app, it'll tell you like what cards you already own, what cards you still need to get. And then it will also tell you the price. So you can look at the total price of your cube. Mm -hmm. And you can also look at the price of cards you don't own. So you can see the value of the cards that you don't own yet that you still need to buy, which is kind of cool too. I don't use Cube Tutor. I haven't really used it at all. So I'm going to let Sean talk a little bit about that. Okay. I think that Cube Tutor is amazing. Like it's... I've seen people manage their cube on a spreadsheet, and I think that that is insane. <laughs> like, there's so many things that you're keeping track of. Converted mana cost, which colors they are, are they a creature or not? And Cube Tutor breaks it down into, like, the, the whole top section is just creatures, organized by mana cost, and each color has a column. You can mouse over a card, and it'll show you what it is. You can keep track of, like, when you're building your cube and go to edit, you can put in like a tag so like if you wanted to do like i've heard of a signed cube where every card is signed you could put like a tag that is like signed and on your cube list it will color that card like green or something like that mine is foil and non-foil and so i have an easy way of keeping track of like these are all the cards i need to get in foil um, if I go into my edit list button, I can sort that way of like only show me non-foil cards. It really is amazing. One one powerful, powerful thing that it does, and I'm not sure if your app does, say I put in a card that is a red card, but I want it to be in the colorless card section, I can go in and actually change the tags on that. You can There's a little drop down and you're just like, force this card to be in the colorless section and it'll go right over there. I've done that with all of my multicolor lands. They're actually in the multicolor section of like all the Selesnia cards are grouped and right at the top, Selesnia Sanctuary, because it, it goes by converted mana cost within that section. I think that, that is super, super powerful. It has all these other tools. I, I can't honestly say that I can I can tell you about all of them. It has a play test mode where you can draft and play sealed with your cube just like by yourself just to test sample packs there is a price button that i wasn't aware of there's no way i can keep track of my cube without this thing a uh, little tip is don't change your cube until you actually 
change your cube. Uh, don't change the list online until you've picked up the card, put it into the new the new sleeve, and put it into your box. Otherwise, the world is madness, and you're going to have to sort your whole cube looking for a specific card. That's miserable. So that was our that was our show on cube. I I think we've kind of covered everything we want to cover. You know, kind of gave just a really um, tip of the iceberg. Uh, for those of you who want to try to create a cube or get into the cube experience yourselves, again, go go look for all these other resources online. You can find them. I encourage you to to start, you know, figure out how Cube Tutor looks and use that. That's going to be a really good resource for you if you want to build a cube. And if I ever decide that I'm serious about creating one of these cubes I've designed, I'm I'm definitely doing Cube Tutor. It makes things so much easier. I guess hashtag not sponsored. Anyway. End time. All right, well, that's the show. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Common Knowledge. Again, big thank you to all of our great sponsors at inkgaming.com and Game Grid Midvale. Check out their online store in the link below, and don't forget about that coupon code CCMTG10. Good for a 10% discount on all ink gaming supplies and accessories. You can find the show on PureMTGO.com as well as the Constructed Criticism YouTube channel. You can also send us an email if you'd like to at commonknowledgemtg at gmail.com. We love your emails. We love reading them. You can find the show on Twitter at CKPodcastMTG, as well as our ever-growing Facebook group, Common Knowledge. And Sean, where can the listeners find you? You can find me on Twitter at Lobbert8, that is L-O-B-B-E-R-T and the number 8, as well as YouTube. You can find me if you just search for Lobbert. I have videos of me playing Popper, uh, usually Popper Leagues there, so check that out. Boom, and you can find me also on Twitter at Clark underscore CK. Thank you so much for listening, and see you next time. Bye. Bye forever.